Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming out today for what is a uh, momentous occasion, both for our college as well as for our honored uh, guests today. My name is Levi Thompson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of our College of Engineering here at the University of Delaware. And I want to welcome those of you who are here in uh, Mitchell Hall, as well as those who are online live streaming to uh, this event where we're going to recognize Rudy Eigenman as the Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'll tell you that one of the most rewarding things that you get to do as a dean is uh, recognize your colleagues, the students, faculty, and staff that make this community. And uh, I'm particularly excited today because uh, Rudy is a special person. We have a lot of special pe people in our college, but uh, he's really been kind of a special person uh, uh, for me personally as well as uh, professionally. The criteria that we use for deciding if you can be a named professor are both simple and difficult at the same time. Uh, first, you have to be among the top 10% in your research discipline as determined by your peers. Uh, second, you've got to, there's the expectation that you're an effective teacher and have made significant contribution to your, uh, contributions to your department's educational mission. And then finally, it's expected that you've served and contributed effectively to your department in uh, other ways. On every account, Rudy Eigenman has uh, exceeded these criteria. He's a renowned leader in the computing area, including the optimization of compilers, programming, methodologies, and performance evaluation for high-performance computing, and the design of cyber infrastructure. Uh, this body of work led to his recognition in 2020 uh, as a fellow of the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Rudy's been a transformative force in the development of advanced digital services and high performance computing. He is a founding member of, uh, or the founder of Darwin, the Delaware Advanced Research Workforce and Innovation Network. Uh, this is a big data and high performance computing system uh, designed to catalyze research and education here in the state of Delaware. You've heard that saying that if you want to go far, you go alone. If you want to go, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you collaborate. Well, Rudy is going far and has gone far. He engages colleagues in multidisciplinary and multi-investigator teams, including with the Data Science Institute, the Data Intensive and Compu Computational Science uh, Core Facility, and the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence. His service extends well beyond the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, he selflessly agreed to serve as the interim chair of the Computer and Information Sciences Department, leading that department through uh, what was a challenging time and also uh, achieving notal notable growth in undergraduate enrollment and hiring two new faculty members. Um, and he obviously didn't have to do that given his, his uh, academic home. Uh, he was a key in recruiting the next uh, chair for that department, Wei Sung Shi. In fact, I think it was a phone call uh, Rudy made to me, and he was very enthusiastic about Wei Sung. Wei Sung ended up on, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you this, but Wei Sung ended up on our list, and uh, fortunately, we were able to recruit him to come to the University of Delaware. Uh, he'll tell you if, what parts of that are true and false. Um, Recently, Rudy was named a co-director of the university's FinTech Enterprise, located in the newest building on Star Campus, the FinTech Innovation Hub. Rudy has proven to be an outstanding scholar and citizen of the university and is deeply engaged uh, with students in his courses and research projects. He teaches foundational courses in, compu in computing that are critical for all of our students and uh, his expertise is in high demand. Rudy, would you mind joining me on the stage? Thank you. 
So we have a small token of our appreciation and recognition of your tremendous impact here at the University of Delaware uh, and your appointment as a named professor in our College of Engineering. So I would like to... Thank you. Thanks. No, don't go anywhere. Uh, this, is in, this medal commemorates Rudy's appointment as the Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering here in the College of Engineering at the University of Delaware. And we encourage you to acknowledge uh, this honor by wearing it during ceremonial events. Um, I think we're supposed to take a few pictures. Is that right? So step. My notes say, step away from the podium. <laughs> the other way? Okay. Is that it? Okay. Good. Don't that was painless. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and now for what we all have been waiting for, Rudy is going to give us a lecture entitled, High Performance Computing, a Scientific and Economic Weapon. All right, thanks, uh, Levi. So let me, let me explain the title. 2015, the, the White House started uh, launched the National Strategic Computing in Initiative. They said HPC is now an economic weapon. It's no longer just reserved for science. We know that for decades we have used high performance computing in computational science um, successfully uh, among us in, in, in academia. But the White House now said it's, it's ready to be deployed widely in, in, in industry, in the private sector. So it's fair to say that together, you know, it's a, it's a scientific weapon, it's, a, it's a, um, a, an economic weapon, and this talk is hopefully going to convince you that there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, you may have seen this, this picture. We, we used to talk, or we often talk about the first pillar of science being theory, right? Paper and, and pencil science. Uh, uh, then come lab experiments, physical experiments, but then comes computation as the third pillar of science. We used to say there are these three pillars of science. When we mean science, what do we really mean? Um, this is a picture I took from the National Science Foundation when I was there uh, 2013 to 17, and one thing that impressed me is that high performance computing computational science is used by all directorates, all of them. This shows the, the directorates of the National Science Foundation, and all of them use very significant computational power. So it's fair to say that computation and the associated data and, and most recently the AI technology is supporting science in the broadest possible way. Uh, performance matters, right? So the main thing, one of the main things about high performance computing is actually the, the performance. Today, as you, I'm sure you all know, today we're not making a single processor super fast. We can't do that anymore. And uh, at the turn of the millennium, that has changed. We had to go parallel. The, the question today is, how can we engage, employ multiple computers, or if you want to say cores or processors in this talk, I use them interchangeably. How can we uh, engage them to make, to solve a problem super fast? So that's sort of the core technology of, of high performance computing. Let me talk about the history of high performance computing a little bit. You may know that 1946 was sort of the first uh, electronic computer, ENIAC, not far from here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, it actually began, speaking of weapons, it, it, it literally began as a military weapon. Even today, high performance computing is often driven by, by defense uh, funding or related funding. ENIAC actually computed ballistic firing tables. Anybody know how fast it was? It multiple thousands of computation per second. By today's standards, that's very slow, but imagine you had to 
you, you had a new system that could do several thousand calculations per second, whereas before there was human calculation on paper and pencil. That was super, a uh, super in, uh, uh, advancement. But nothing compared to what we see today. And because of this phenomenal growth, it has been very, very difficult for even experts to predict what's going to happen. Here, a little side trivia for your enjoyment. You may have heard that. In 1943, it, you know, admittedly, two years before ENIAC was, was, was created. So uh, T.J. Watson didn't quite know uh, how, a, how a computer even looked like, but he dared to predict that I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Now, I bet all of you have more than five computers in your pocket. Your cell phone alone is, has a multiprocessor, and, uh, which has between four and eight cores. So four to eight full-fledged computers that were drastically faster than, than ENIAC. Um, Ken Olson, president and founder of, of, of Tech Digital Equipment Corporation, 1977, said, there's really no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. I'll leave that as is. Um, Bill Gates, most of you know Bill Gates. He predicted that 640K of memory ought to be enough. I still remember I was in grad school when the first uh, PC came out with one megabyte of memory, and I thought, what? <laughs> a megabyte? Who would ever use a megabyte? Well, today we have several gigabytes, several thousand times the memory uh, that, uh, that Bill uh, Gates predicted would be enough. Also interesting, 1994, just about six years before that turn that happened that forced the computer industry to go parallel, right? Until sort of the turn of the millennium, single processors were getting faster and faster and faster, and at, at some point that wasn't possible anymore because they just simply produced too much heat. So the computer industry had to cr create multiple smaller cores on a chip. They produced less heat, right? So that, that was what, what, what forced the industry to go parallel. But six years before that really hit head on the industry, people were even doubting, is parallel processing technology ever going to make it or will it disappear? So back to my history of HPC, just a few data points. Cray-1 is sort of a very important uh, data point as one of the, arguably, one of the first supercomputers there are. Anybody know how fast it is compared to your cell phone? I just looked it up. So uh, an iPhone 14, I, I looked it up, is about ten, uh, two teraflops. The Cray machine was about 10 times less. So you have uh, five to 10 Crays in your pocket. Um, a key thing of the Cray-1 was it was a specialized, very, very super fast computer built for high performance uh, processing. In the 90s then, we saw a transformation. We saw the clusters of uh, off-the-shelf processors uh, come about. Um, some, call, uh, some called it the killer micros, so the, the microprocessors that killed the supercomputers. So they uh, more and more or, or steadily replaced the big supercomputers, and today they prevailed. If you look at the fastest computer, at least public computer, the Frontier uh, computer at the Oak, Oak Ridge National Lab, it has 8.7 million cores. This is absolutely phenomenal. Anybody knows the speed? It's roughly one exaflop, 10 to the 18 operations per second. It's just. Uh, near unbelievable. Uh, another data point, uh, the Cedar machine at the University of Illinois was sort of arguably the last supercomputer. I think it was the last supercomputer built at the university. I had the chance of joining that project as a postdoc in 1988. Um, it built not the processors themselves, but sort of the interconnection technology. That was the special thing about the Cedar machine. Uh, another special thing was that there was co-design. Today, would, you would call it co-design. There was a hardware group, there was a system software group, and there was an application group. And together, they looked at, uh, at the best ways of, of building that machine. The system software group included compilers, and I will say a little bit about compilers because that became my core research area. Um, 
in, two, in 1995, I joined then uh, Purdue University and really made uh, high performance computing compilers my, my research area. What is it? Well, think of a standard program. You, most of you may have written a, a program in some programming languages. Standard program, programming languages specify things one step at a time, so it's sequential, not parallel execution. Um, what I did with my research was to transform these programs into a way that could execute fast on supercomputers. The, the core technology being parallelization, so finding ways of executing this program so that it can be done by multiple cores, multiple computers at the same time. So I, we call that automatic parallelization. Um, the last four years of my stay at, at Purdue, I was on loan to the National Science Foundation. A few uh, takeaways from that is there was a, really an insatiable appetite for compute power across all sciences. I, I showed you that picture that shows all the directorates of, of NSF, and really there's not a single one that did not want increased compute powers. In fact, those who didn't start out using a lot of compute power, they were just among the fastest growing users of, of uh, compute power. A good example is the social behavior and economic science. That directorate started, we had sort of tracked it over time from 2005 to 2015, and in 2005 they were very low, but in 2015 they used 10 times more than the highest user uh, in 2005. The highest user, probably still today is the highest user, the directorate, MPS, math, physical sciences, includes material science, chemistry, astrophysics. These are probably the biggest users. Growing awareness of universities of the value of cyber infrastructure investment. Cyber infrastructure is, includes the hardware, high performance computing, but also the software, networking, cyber security, um, uh, the, the people infrastructure that go with it. Uh, there was growing awareness that investment in this actually is good for universities, and I, I will come back to this a little bit. I was program manager for a project called Exceed that was building the interface so that users could use the national infrastructure sponsor, sponsored by, by uh, NSF of, of the big computer systems so they could use that somewhat um, um, uniformly, so they didn't have to go to the individual centers and, and negotiate how to best use them, but there was sort of a common interface. Let me enlarge this picture a little bit. Some of the biggest uh, centers were, for example, the San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, uh, University of Illinois has traditionally been a powerhouse in, in supercomputing. Uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and uh, today, the biggest is, is probably the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So these were really the big, uh, the big uh, providers of uh, computational services. They were successful in competing for uh, uh, these uh, big machine solicitations. Uh, NSF, in the past, uh, roughly every two years, spends $30 million to build a new machine and put it at one of these at one of these centers, and these big four that, that I mentioned are very, are very successful in winning these grants. There's also in the state of Indiana, Purdue and uh, Indiana University both have uh, won significant awards, and what you see there in the circle is the University of Illinois. Now, we're not one of the big winners of a $30 million machine, but the Darwin machine, a $2 million machine, we decided to make a few cycles available to that national network, and in doing that, it in a way, we became part of the map, and I think it was sort of a strategic decision. We are now not only part of the map, but we're also joining the, the monthly meetings or biweekly meetings with the big centers to learn about what it takes to be part of, of that group, and maybe eventually will become one of the, uh, of the big machine providers and win one of these big awards as well. Um, so, I hope I con convinced you that high performance computing is at least an interesting technology. Now, let me ask the question, is there actually evidence, or what evidence is there that there's this value? I showed you this picture already showing the, uh, the directorates, so making the case that 
high performance computing is really applicable to all sciences. There's not a single science area that does not want to use uh, compute cycles. Uh, we even have in this AI center uh, of excellence that Levi mentioned, we had a project that uh, deals with fashion design. Even them, even those start more and more using computational technology, especially the, the computational technology underlying some of the AI models. What more is there? So in 2016, I think there was a very important event that the first Nobel Prize was awarded for a project that uses computational methods. So that really put HPC in, its, in a new league, right? It's now absolutely a cutting edge technology with which you can do the very best science on this planet. Arguably, you could say even Bill Sharp's Nobel Prize in 1990 had a computational component. I recently, because of my FinTech involvement, now I learned about Bill Sharp. Maybe many of you know what, who Bill Sharp is. He has developed this economic model that uh, defines the ratio or quantifies the ratio of risk and return. So if you do uh, 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 financial investments, you want to know what's the ratio of risk versus return. Bill Sharp um, defined an economic model to evaluate that and won the Nobel Prize in 1990. Of course, his work was prior to 1990. It involved computation as well, but maybe not high performance computing. But still the roots go back to many decades uh, before the, the chemistry Nobel Prize. Another very important study, uh, Apon and Ahalt, now 10 years ago, I hope it will get a refresh soon, that study. They tracked universities that invest in, in high performance computing. And they, they found that the, that investment correlates with increase in ranking. I thought this was a, a, a very, very well done study. Of course, what's cause and effect is not clear. Are universities that go up in ranking, are they investing in HPC or the other way around? So that didn't come out of the study, but as, at least it's a very interesting correlation. Yet another study looked at all the papers. Uh, you know, you can't read this vertically. These are all the papers that have, have at least a few computational uh, 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 papers. And then the authors compared the average citation count of the papers with the citation count of the computational papers. And they found that computational papers have higher citation counts. So they have more visibility. Arguably, uh, they are higher qualities, or at least very good quality as well. That also shows that computational work is of very high scientific value. Last but not least, the four, four to one ratio. <laughs> To me, this is a very important uh, uh, a study that was done. W what does it mean? When I was program manager of, of Exceed, uh, Exceed had uh, a very significant component, essentially a big group of what today we would call research software engineers, helping in the nation those who develop computational applications in chemistry, physics, uh, biology, etc. And they helped them essentially get the, get the projects off the ground. So I asked this group to quantify their value as follows. I said, ask the, the domain scientists that you support it, what, in their estimates, how long would it have taken them to do the job? And then we compare this with the time they invested. And we came up with a four to one ratio. So the computational experts were four times as, as productive as in their admittedly subjective investments that domain scientists thought that it would take them to do the job. Some said we couldn't have done it without. So our science would have been a no-go had we not had the support of these research software engineers. So again, that shows, in my opinion, the value of that cyber infrastructure in this specific case, not the computational resources, but the people infrastructure. All right, let me bore you for a few minutes. Let me tell you what I'm actually doing. <laughs> compilers, what are compilers, right? This is a slide I have in my, at the beginning of my, my, my course on compilers. And I say compilers is the biggest thing in the universe, uh, at least in the IT universe. It translates between man and machine. So if you want to talk to a machine, you use a human programming language, 
a little bit like English, not quite like English, but you know, some English terms in it. Underneath there's a machine, and we all know that machines uh, understand ones and zeros, right? So there has to be some kind of a translation process. That's what we call a compiler. So that translation from the human readable programming language to the ones and zeros that the machine understand, that's really what the compilers do. And that's highly sophisticated. It takes at least three cores, sort of a basic compiler course, an advanced compiler course, and then usually a grad course in optimizations for compilers to understand sort of the basics of it. Today you have programming languages like C, C++, Java, Python. You may have heard of those. Underneath we want to execute these programs on workstations, multi-cores, GPUs, um, graphics processing units. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to explain it today, but it's an important computational component. General high performance computing systems. So that's the situation today, but we're not satisfied with that. Today, tomorrow we want much higher level programming language. We sometimes call them specification language, some something in which you can much better express what you do. Also the underlying hardware that we want to execute our programs on changes. There may be globally distributed systems, uh, edge computing devices, uh, if you will, uh, cloud resources, drastically more complex than what we have today. So the compilers translating from the languages to the machines have to continually in, uh, evolve and get more and more sophisticated. So that's why this research area is exciting and keeps being exciting and has to evolve tremendously. One of the key, so there are many optimizations. We call them optimizations in that translation process. The key optimizations that I want to talk about is really to the parallelization. How do we extract from the program that you wrote in Python, say, how can we map that onto something that can run in parallel? Let me use an analogy. Let me take a gardening analogy assuming some of you are garden, hobby gardeners. So let's say you have one gardener. The gardener is super obedient, but does not think on his own. He's not supposed to think of it on his own. He is just really doing exactly what you say. And now you want to make him shovel a pile from here to there. You may write a program, something like this. Scoop up a shovel of dirt, turn around, empty the shovel, Repeat until there's no more dirt. Now you've written actually a program. We call this a loop, right? So many iterations where you shovel the dirt, turn around, empty the shovel until there's a termination condition. Now let's assume you have 10 gardeners. What do you do now? Well, you say, could be straightforward. Each gardener works on part of the dirt. So they pick a few loop iterations, we say. And does that work well? Well, even that simple example has a, a, a bunch of challenges. The pile must be large. If you have a small pile, it does not make no sense to have 10 gardeners. Same in computation. If the loop is too small, it doesn't make sense to parallelize it. Second, the gardeners may get in each other's way if there's not enough space for them. Same in computers, the memory bandwidth needs to be big enough so that the, each processor can actually do the work and can access memory, bring data back and forth. Or there must be enough shovels. Imagine you have 10 gardeners, only two shovels, what do you do? That wouldn't make sense, right? Same with computers. There's uh, different functional units, especially the, the specialized functional units are sometimes shared uh, among the processors. And so we must make sure that there's not a bottleneck. So now try to rewrite this program into a way that really efficiently uh, exploits these 10 gardeners despite all these challenges. And if you have done that, I think you have understood quite a bit about uh, parallelization. And then doing it automatically is what we're trying to do when we do it in the compiler. So let me bore you just a little more and now get for just two slides a bit more technical. So we have this loop now in, with eight iterations. I already said it has to be many, many, many more than eight, but for illustration, I take just eight. 
And just a simple array assignment, so the value of the array B gets assigned to the value A. If I write it out, you see these eight assignments, and let's assume you have four processors or cores or, 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 or computers, if you will, for two deities are interchangeable. Then you do something like this, right? You, you just s split up this, this space and assign um, parts to processor one, two, three, four. And this works fairly well in this example. If you actually look at the data being accessed by the different processors, the data is completely different. Processor one uh, accesses A and B of one and two. Processor two accesses A and B of, of three and four, and they're completely disjoint. We call this a regular problem, uh, and the regular data access pattern, automatic parallelization has worked well for three decades in, in doing this. It's very simple. But, as you can expect, now it gets complicated, an irregular case, and I, I promise this is the last sort of low-level detail slide that shows you my, my research. Uh, let's assume we have now what we call a subscripted subscript. So instead of just I in the index of the array A, array A we have another array. So an indirection array, right? And since we don't know what's the content of, of the array C, we don't quite know where is this access really. Does that happen? Yes, modern applications are to an increasing uh, extent irregular, sparse matrix computation, or you, you may have heard terms like that, of so graph algorithms. And so now if we write out uh, what's, what's happening here, we see that we no longer quite know where does, which element of array A is being accessed in these various uh, uh, computations. And since we don't know where it is, they may actually point to the same element. That creates a lot of conflict. We have difficulty paralyzing it. A user may sort of know or guess, you know, where these uh, accesses really go, but the compiler has no clue what to do, at least not until now. So. In one, in, in one box, so our sort of cutting edge research that we're currently doing, one of my grad students developed so-called so symbolic program analysis techniques that goes through the program, tries to figure out with partial execution of the program, can I tell something about the content of the array C? And if I know something of the con about the content of the array C, maybe I can tell if this program is parallelizable. One of the properties then of the, the array C that we're interested in is so-called monotonicity. So the array C, the first value is less than the second, less than the third, less than the fourth. If we can tell from symbolically analyzing the program that this property holds, then we can actually infer that these accesses are independent and we can parallelize those. So this is the first time, this is something that has eluded compilers for, for several decades and we have just uh, published a paper with, with this technology. So that's the latest and greatest in, 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 in compilers, at least in, in uh, my group. All right, let's go back. Um, I hope I have convinced you that HPC is interesting, there are interesting problems, it, 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 it's valuable. How can we take advantage of that HPC weapon? Two things, right? One is interdisciplinary work. I really believe that there's a lot of opportunities in multidisciplinary work. Uh, this is, of course, true almost anywhere, but especially in high-performance computing, computational science, it's intrinsically true because there are the domain science applications or the domain sciences and the computer science from the get-go. In many cases, multiple domains are involved. Uh, think of uh, climate modeling. You need to understand the actual atmospheric uh, phenomena. You need to understand the, the, the land cover. You need to understand the ocean behavior. And you may even understand the, the chemistry of the water droplets because they may actually affect the, the climate as well. So many, many sciences involved in just uh, this, this simple example. How do we best do that? If we wait for a solicitation and then put a team together, usually it's too late. How can we be proactive? This is probably one of the biggest challenges in, in enabling multidisciplinary work. One way that I know of being proactive is to put informal 
brainstorming groups together. I keep saying, and you may have heard me say that, best ideas come out of coffee breaks. One of the coffee break series that we're doing is the, what we started out uh, defining as HPC lunches, and late we, lately we have joined uh, forces with the data science group and also with, with the AI group. And we hold maybe twice, three times a semester uh, an event where we informally um, get together, uh, talk about a theme, and brainstorm and mingle, and hopefully good ideas will come out of that. The FinTech uh, initiative that I'm now uh, starting to get engaged with will do something similar, not just bringing faculty together, but also the private sector, the companies uh, that are involved in financial technology in the FinTech building and in the state of Delaware in general will bring together uh, uh, to this coffee break as well and brainstorm about uh, projects. When I was a faculty, a young faculty member, I asked my department head, give me some advice. And he says, well, there's one thing I'm going to tell you. Don't just spend time in this one building. Go across campus, make sure you know at least one person in every building. And I had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, over the years, I, I was engaged in several multi, multidisciplinary projects today with Mariana Safranova in physics. I'm doing a physics portal. She has some of the best computed uh, uh, properties of, of atoms that are in high demand. And she has received so many emails, give me your data, give me your data, that she decided she needs to de design a portal. And we're defining that. Uh, we're creating such a portal with her uh, to uh, make that data widely available. Uh, Levi mentioned the Darwin supercomputer uh, that we uh, have here at, at uh, UD. That really came out of the HPC launches. Uh, many of the participants gave me abstracts that said, if we bring such a computer to UD, this is the science project I'm going to do with this machine. And I think that led to a very strong science case and, and we were sec successful in, in securing funding for that machine. Um, the FinTech uh, Innovation Hub just recently was uh, the, uh, the inaugural event, the, the ribbon cutting, and I, I mentioned already there will bring interdisciplinary teams together as well in the area of financial technology, which I know very, very little about, but we can always learn. Um, I see Anthony here in the room, so <laughs> I've been talking to Anthony. We don't have funding yet, but about possible a project on a blood flow simulation. It's something that I tried with a colleague back at Purdue already. So it's a very interesting uh, project today for simple arterial uh, shapes. We can, we can do certain simulation. Of course, the far end goal is to simulate an entire arterial tree of a, of a human. Let me talk about at least a few projects uh, before I came to UD, because this is, uh, in 2009, we became the headquarters of what's called the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation, a civil engineering project, a very large project, $100 million from NSF. This shows you, so there were many labs involved, and the goal was to do data collections of all the civil engineering projects. So we were, in a way, the first big data project of the national or one of the big, first big data project of the National Science Foundation. This shows you the biggest outdoor shake tables in the world. is at uh, UCSD in San Diego. And they built an 18-story uh, building prototype that they uh, uh, put here on this outdoor shake table that they shake with an earthquake motion, and then they can study uh, mechanical properties of the building material. Um, one other project that we didn't get funding, but the, the process is interesting. I was at Purdue at one time, the director of the Computing Research Institute. I went around the departments, and I found somebody that, who does brain simulation, another person in a different department doing blood flow simulation, human motion simulation, or even impact studies uh, of, of uh, accidents on, on humans. And I said to them, let's, let's start to meet regularly and see if we can put all these pieces together and formulate something like an overall human simulator project. I left Purdue before we actually got funding for that, but I thought the process was very interesting of putting these groups together. Very similar was actually what we termed virtual mission to Mars. In astro astronomy, so somebody studied planetary trajectories. In mechanical engineering, 
they studied aerodynamics of rockets in chemistry, the rocket fuel, and in biology, they studied life on Mars. So we put again this, this group together and said, let's, let's see if we can come up with a, with a coherent project that eventually we go for funding. Like I said, you don't always need to react, just to react to funding. A little known secret is that the National Science Foundation actually takes unsolicited proposal. So we could come up with this idea and once it's well, once it's well shaped, we can write a white paper to, to NSF and maybe if it looks good enough, they're inclined to fund it. I've seen multi-million dollar projects funded this way, not just small projects. So this is about a multidisciplinary project. Another thing I wanted to mention, uh, something that came out uh, certainly out of the, our uh, HBC lunch um, gatherings is that we need to support the dom domain sciences, physicists, uh, chemists, uh, biologists, need the support of the computational experts. We call them today research software engineers. There's actually a, a US organization, US RSE. I want to build such a team uh, in addition to the big need. I believe that it really increases scientific quality. It increases potentially university ran ranking. Remember the four to one ratio, right? If we build such a group, they will be very, very productive. They can do things that your chemistry, biology postdocs, as good as they are, they may not be able to do because they don't necessarily have the computational background. So building such a team is, I think, very valuable. I'm talking to the university administration. We may actually get such a position soon. We're writing proposals to, the, uh, to NSF, and I'm also talking to all of you domain scientists to, uh, to write such positions into your grants, because if you, if you do that, you may borrow that person from our pool rather than you having to hire and at the end of the project fire that, that person, right? So hopefully that will be a service to you as well. All right, before I conclude, um, just some random thoughts on the future. I believe that high performance computing and the associated data and AI technology will continue to grow. Um, but I also believe that it's increasingly under the hood which is good and bad. It's, it's good because the domain science projects should be the front line, right? So this is a blood flow simulation. It's not the high performance computing technology that we're developing. But there's also danger of, of being, being forgotten that you may think of, of just the domain science in the first place and for, maybe forget that it's very important to hire maybe a computational expert as part of the project as well. A little bit similar to math, right? Math is incredibly important for what we do, but often we forget the enabling nature that it has. Um, something that I believe is an opportunity on, on the top right uh, data science today is mostly an observation science, right? We, we look at the data, we maybe do some, some uh, correlation, we do maybe some visualization to see, do we see some uh, um, color trends. Um, we rarely find governing equations from looking at the data. On the other hand, simulation really looks at the uh, governing equation that then builds a simulation model to simulate that up. I believe there's a tremendous opportunity in combining the two, and I have seen little research yet to do that. So I think this is, a, this is an absolute uh, uh, opportunity that we, uh, I hope we can find a way of seizing. Um, in a, maybe I should address, uh, say something about the question I often get asked in, in the world of, in, a, in time of chat GPT, right? Uh, will all, all our jobs get, get uh, 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 disappear. <laughs> I do believe that many information processing jobs may disappear because information processing is what, what our computational and data and AI technology can do. Where is the, where is the limit? We uh, have all seen uh, reports that even, even uh, um, uh, radiologists now get competition with, with uh, uh, that, that AI technology is, is able to detect cancer better than they are. Maybe that is a danger, but what I believe is not a danger, and I'm not really too worried about our jobs being replaced, is that the ultimate interpretation, you know, to co uh, uh, continue on the, uh, in, in that medical uh, example, 
the ultimate decision on what, what treatment to give the patient, I cannot imagine that any, any automated system can, can tell before long. I could be wrong, but I'm not too worried about that. Last point I want to make is human-computer interfaces, of course, also powered by, by very powerful computational capabilities, is probably going to change the way we uh, interact and live in ways that are go both uh, good and possibly bad. So we all have seen people just having their ear pods in, in the ears and not reacting to the others <laughs> in, in the universe any, anyway. Uh, the ear pods are not directly connected to us, so it's still relatively a s simple hu uh, a human uh, uh, interface. But imagine uh, a limb, an artificial limb. Clearly, uh, if somebody loses their limb, it's, it's a great technology if, if we can uh, if they can have a new limb and connect it directly to the brain. But imagine in a crazy, crazy uh, vision here, imagine this technology gets so sophisticated in a generation maybe from now that and then your daughter some, suddenly comes home and says, Dad, I would like to have a, a stronger arm. What would you say, right? Is that a crazy vision? Maybe. But I actually see that... Uh, if technology gets more and more sophisticated, uh, possibilities like this exist. All right, before I conclude, I want to give thanks to, this is my student group on top uh, and, and uh, students I've worked with. Uh, you know the saying that professors are only as good as their grad students. Um, and I've had the pleasure over the years to work with really excellent students, and they have made all the difference in, in my projects. Also, big thanks to my collaborators, uh, Kathy Wu, Ben Bogosi, uh, Arthi Chayaraman, and Bill Totner, the co-PIs on the Darwin uh, project. Mariana Safranova is the physics PI on this project that I mentioned. Sunita Chandrasekhar and I've, we had a benchmarking project together, and uh, John Hoffman, uh, I have interacted with uh, John and Bill are in the UDIT department. One special thing I have here, uh, we have here at, at UD is that the relationship between the academic sector and UDIT is very good. Back at Purdue and even at, at uh, 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 NSF, I, I was convinced that universities that have a good relationship between the two, which are, is not always the case, they have really a competitive advantage. And, you know, my big thanks to, be, to, to, to Bill and, and John for, for really being great collaborators in, in, in the UDIT team. I want to mention just two non-UD uh, people, uh, DK Panda at Ohio State. He leads the AI Institute that I'm involved in, does a great job uh, leading that. And Julia Ramirez is the civil engineer that uh, was the PI on this $100 million project that I mentioned, the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation. So concluding, just a few points. I really believe that all the sciences are uh, uh, increasingly drawing from computational data, AI technology. Uh, HPC is a key enabler. We will see increased impact. We will see increased ranking if we engage in this technology. I you know, I, I ask you, I beg you to uh, engage in multidisciplinary projects, maybe join the HPC data, AI launches, uh, also help us build this RSC group. I think we will all benefit from such an activities. And that's all I wanted to say today. So if you're okay with it, we'll take some questions. Sure. And it would be helpful, we have people online, so it's good uh, to use the microphone so that they can hear you. Yes. Congratulations once again, and uh, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, given your hardware software background and uh, what you have seen in the evolution of hardware from several cores to GPUs now, um, so going from here to another, say, 10, 15 years, you know, uh, we're seeing explosion of AI hardware, TPUs, et cetera. 
So um, and LLMs, large language models, for example, on the software side. So what, what I keep wondering is, how do we prep our next generation workforce uh, with respect to teaching education? Not just for the next year or two years, but what kind of vision should we give them that what they should envision, you know, years to come? Um, and how do we prepare them? Because it seems like an explosion in, in both hardware, software, co-designs. Right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just came back from a workshop where several speakers said, we really don't know what's coming at us, right? So the, the field of computer architecture and the associated software is wide open again. And like it was actually several decades again, and so we saw sort of a narrowing, so a, bit, a bit of uniformity in computer architecture, and now suddenly it, 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 it broadens again. So how do we prepare our, our workforce? I guess, uh, the old saying goes, right, you learn, how, you learn to learn, right? So no specific technology uh, can be taught, but maybe a little bit of everything, make, that, make them critical thinkers, maybe the, the best, uh, uh, the best res recipe for the future. Well, congratulations to Rudy, it's a great presentation. So I have just a, a, a quick question. Uh, what do you see the future of the uh, Darwin project? Uh, very good question. So Darwin has probably another lifetime of maybe two years. It's out of warranty, so, but we can replace it with you know, parts from behind the system, right? <laughs> and then we see less, uh, fewer and fewer nodes at some point, and at some point IT may des decide it's no longer feasible to support it. Uh, we're, uh, 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 really engaging in discussions of, of, of what next, right? At some point, I talked a few years ago, I, I talked to our CEO, Sharon Pitt, uh, was it at that time, you know, could we use, uh, the, ideally Darwin would be a staging to then the, for the next big sis system, the, one of the $30 million systems. Uh, I'm not sure if we're ready because the, the computational staff and the IT staff it takes to um, have such a system is, is a bit larger than what we have. So maybe we can try another MRI, the major research instrumentation program that Darwin ca came out of. But at, uh, eventually, I think it would be great for us if we could uh, show and, and, uh, and prepare the staff and the expertise to take that next level and become really a, a, a very serious uh, competitor for one of the big machines. Could you get something like that through the AI Institute? Uh, that's certainly a component uh, that, that could make a difference in such a proposal. Rudy, thanks for a great talk and uh, congratulations on your name professorship. I think you mentioned uh, the biggest machine today has 8.7 million cores. Uh, my question is, is there a limit to how high that number can go? Is, are there any fundamental constraints on that? From a hardware point of view, it seems there's no fundamental constraint, right? We can just put more and more cores together and we have a faster machine. From a software point of view, you, you see this phenomenon that there are fewer and fewer applications that really can take advantage of the full machine. So the machine is often uh, run, the, the machine often runs multiple applications at the same time. You could argue that you don't need a big machine for that. You could use several smaller machines for that, right? So that, that's sort of a, a, a discussion. So why do they put such a big machine together? Bragging rights. You want the US wants to show up at, at the top of the so-called top 500 list, half the fastest machine in the universe, gives us bragging rights, demonstrates our, our technology capability to some extent, right? You can argue with that. Um, but in terms of a real benefit to, to computational applications, I see a, an increasing number of researchers that actually question that. So that's in a way a, a limit, right? I want to ask a follow-on to that. So if there was such a problem, what would it look like? You know, something that would need all of those cores. I mean, just think outside the box. What would that look like? Overall world simulation, right? That uh, includes the climate simulation, the, the economy simulation, the, you know, all the, the, the phenomena that you can think of on this planet and projects into the, into the future what happens. That's a knee-jerk reaction.
first, uh, c congratulations, Rudy. I also wonder, you didn't mention anything about quantum computing, but I wonder if you had any thoughts or how that intersects with your interests. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking that, that question. When I uh, uh, was at the N NSCI, the National Strategic Computing Initiative, the inaugural uh, uh, workshop, there was a keynote speaker saying quantum computing is 50 years ago, uh, uh, 50 years away. So to me, that means we really don't have a good idea on how to make it a reality. Uh, I keep asking who I can, that despite tremendous progress in quantum computing, that time hasn't shrunk and come much closer. Um, so I think it's still in a research development stage. It may take a long time before a quantum computer comes our way that is a serious competitor for our classical supercomputers. I welcome disagreements with this, but that's, that's what I see. I don't know, this is on, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, what do you think of the growing gap between industry and academia, um, especially in the AI world, with regards to um, GPU access and um, cluster access? Um, it, for example, companies that with like the H100s that have come out, GPUs, are buying over on the order of hundreds of thousands of these GPUs, while academic, you know, like universities don't have access to that. Um, yeah, so what do you think of that? And especially with regards to like AI researchers in small labs, academic yeah. labs. Yeah, I, I think it is, it, it is a serious concern that because AI takes these tremendous resources and industry has the deeper pockets to acquire these resources than we have at the, at the universities, we may not be um, in, in a position to train the AI models, right, and, and use, use these resources. I hope we can find ways around that by having collaborative projects and showing industry what value we can, we can bring to the table if they engage with us and uh, uh, allow us to use these resources as well. Congratulations, Rudy. Um, so channeling the inner Bill Gates, I guess, I can't imagine anyone using more than a Yadabyte of, uh, <laughs> but, um, so most of the examples you showed, uh, you know, showed the trajectory of it was the cost of the machine or how fast you could do it. But now it, with no end in sight, energy and power are a big piece of, you know, what, what's going to limit your application. So could you comment on the aspect of energy and power and how that's going to change things going to the future? Right. It, uh, a few decades ago, I think that the awareness of, of the compute power consumed by these high performance computing system became, you know, we realized, or we, the high performance computing community realized that this is a serious issue. Uh, fortunately, uh, architects so far over the past few decades have made tremendous progress. Um, the, I think I just looked it up, the Frontier machine, despite its phenomenal uh, uh, computational power uses something like uh, 22 kilowatts, which is a big chunk of, of, of energy, right? It's about uh, 22, uh, a house roughly uses, a, a average house roughly a, a kilowatt, so it's the, the power consumed by 22 houses, but still it's way less uh, per compute power unit than uh, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, the, the supercomputers had. So there's progress being made. E eventually, I think it's still a concern, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that tremendous progress is made in this direction. Uh, one example is, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the GPUs that, that uh, have been mentioned a few times. They're extremely uh, power efficient. like we've exhausted the questions. Um, let me again thank Rudy for a wonderful lecture and for all thank of you. his contributions to the University of Delaware thank you. Uh, and his department. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank those who helped organize this. Wendy Jordan, who's in the back. Wendy, you want to raise your hand? Oh, she is. Wendy. Just, yeah, let's, let's give her a round of applause.
And then uh, Stephanie Maybe, who I think is over on this side. So thank you both for your help in organizing this. And we have refreshments over in the uh, DuPont uh, foyer. So we'd love to have you all join us there uh, so we can continue to celebrate Rudy's named lecture or a professorship. Thank you. Thank you.